On the way home, I was sitting at a stoplight, and some jerk plowed right into me. I'm okay, but it's gonna cost a fortune to fix the car. At least I have insurance. You know, it's a wonder that insurance companies stay in business when they've got to deal with things as unpredictable as car accidents. They survive by taking advantage of a statistical concept we'll learn about in this program, the law of large numbers. We'll also learn rules for adding and multiplying the means and variances of random variables. We'll meet one of the most widespread types of probability distributions, the binomial distribution. And we'll learn simple ways to calculate the mean and standard deviation of binomial distributions. Insurance companies deal in all kinds of random events, fires, floods, car accidents. The companies can't predict when someone will file a claim. But if the pool of policyholders is big enough, they can predict accident rates with surprising accuracy. This is like coin flipping. We can't predict the next outcome, but we can predict a long-term pattern. The law of large numbers is a way of defining this phenomenon. Since we know the probability of getting ahead is 50-50 on every toss, if we flip four coins many times, the mean number of heads will approach two in the long run. And that's what the law of large numbers says. Stated formally, the law says that the mean result of a large number of independent trials comes close to the true mean of a distribution. Now, many people expect even short sequences to have the same regular pattern that's predicted for the long term. But we know that's not always the case. For example, because of random variation, it's possible to get four heads out of four coin tosses. But people don't understand randomness very well, and so when strings like that happen, they think it's meaningful. This misperception is called the myth of small numbers. You can find those who believe it, as well as those who've challenged it with scientific research in the world of basketball. Once you get a streak going, it just seems like you can hit a shot uh, with your eyes closed. It's a great feeling when everything is going right, you know, there's no feeling like it. When you experience success, it, you know, it breeds more success and, uh, you know, you make a couple shots or spectacular plays and you just feel it coming and you just feel that, hey, there's no way I can miss tonight. Two minutes, quarter. Players believe that you make several shots, you feel confident, you become relaxed, you get in a groove and almost any shot you're going to put up is going to go in. Players describe it as the basket seems huge. Our empirical question is, is that the case? If you've made several shots in a row, are you more likely to then make your next one, two, or three shots than if you've missed several shots in a row? We started with the simplest step first, was to just get a hold of the field goal statistics from all games played, or at least all home games, from the Philadelphia 76ers during a real NBA season and we just looked at the distribution of hits and misses. Does making a shot tend to make you ever so slightly more likely to make your next shot? There is no positive correlation between successive shots. In fact, there's a slight negative correlation. And what that means, translated into a more intuitive statistic, is that the probability of making a shot after having just made your shot uh, isn't greater than after having just missed your shot, which is contrary to what all basketball players, and in fact, what I believed up until that time. Now, you might argue that, well, maybe there's something like a hot hand that exists, but it's masked by a bunch of other things, and it just doesn't show up in the data. For example, maybe it's the case that a hot player takes more difficult shots. So the player would be more likely to make a shot of given difficulty but that is perfectly covered up by the fact that they're taking more difficult shots. So we've got two things going on that work in the opposite direction. Free throws in many ways provides us with a natural experiment to examine that very question because they are usually shot in pairs. They're always shot from exactly the same distance so there's no change in the difficulty of the shot. And there's no defensive pressure. And we look at two full seasons of Boston Celtic free throw uh, statistics and we find players are not any more likely to make their second shot after making or missing their first. The outcome of the second shot is independent of the first shot. Some people object to this research by saying that we're dismissing basketball as nothing but chance and nothing could be further from the truth. This does not in any way take away from the uh, beauty or complexity of the game.
Unlike basketball, in statistics, it's the long term we care about. The law of large numbers helps us calculate long term outcomes of random variables. In many cases, it's important to be able to combine information from two random variables. Suppose for a minute that we've just won the lottery and we're faced with the pleasant task of deciding how to invest the fortune. For simplicity's sake, we'll decide whether to put the money into the stock market or U.S. government treasury bills. Since the rates of return on stocks and T-bills vary unpredictably over time, it's not easy to decide. Let's take a close look at each option. Here's a relative frequency histogram for the average rate of return on common stocks over the past 30 years. We'll call this random variable x. You can tell immediately that the variation is wide, from a loss of 15% to a gain of 43%. You can also see that the mean is relatively high, about 14%. Now here's the distribution for the rate of return on t-bills. We'll call this random variable y. The variance is much smaller. In fact, not once in 30 years did people lose money in T-bills. But the mean is also smaller, about 6%. Now, since we've heard that we shouldn't put all our eggs in one basket, we'll decide to put half our fortune in stocks and half in T-bills. What rate of return can we expect? That's the same as asking, what is the mean of the sum of two random variables? Before we do that, let's learn some basic rules. The formula for the first one looks like this. It shows that adding any number a to all the values of the random variable x gives you the same mean as adding a to the mean of x. Likewise, multiplying all the values of x by any number b gives you the same mean as multiplying the mean of x by b. In other words, if you add or multiply all values of a random variable by the same number, you simply add or multiply the mean by the same amount. Of course, the same is true for subtraction or division. The second rule says that the mean of the sum of the random variables x and y equals the mean of x plus the mean of y. We'll use both rules in finding the expected rate of return on the investment of our fortune. Since we divided our money in half, the rate of return we get is 1 half x plus 1 half y. The mean rate of return for the combined investment is 1 half the mean of x, stocks, plus 1 half the mean of y, t-bills. That's 1 half times 0.14 plus 1 half times 0.06, which gives us a combined rate of return of 0.1 or 10%. That relatively simple calculation illustrates both our rules. First, we multiplied each of two random variables by a constant. In this case, both the constants were 1 half and then we added the resulting products. Now, why not just put the whole wad into the investment with the highest return? Well, there's a little more to it than that.